Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They're posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting for July 12, 2022 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by Member Perez. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are pre present with the exception of Member Gray and Member Snively. We have three sets of minutes to be approved today, June 14, 2022 School Board Workshop, June 7, 2022 School Board Meeting, June 21, 2022 School Board Meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? If not, please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live wide webcast on cable TV and on video monitors here in the auditorium. Also can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archives. 
Thank you, Member Washington. We have one item scheduled for time certain, and that's 6 o'clock, which is employee input. We'll now move on to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policies in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. When there are 30 seconds left, you'll see a le yellow light on the lectern and a red light and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I'll now call up the first speakers. First speaker, please. Hi. Is this on? <laughs> Dr. Wendy Samford, nice to meet you all. Yes, I know that you recognize me. I'm here today for good news to talk to you about a program that I have recently become familiar with. Um, I'm a guardian ad litem, and there's a lot of training that goes along with that program. And one of the training uh, sessions that I sat through was for a program called Handle with Care. And I just thought I would come down here and just talk for a minute or two minutes and 37 seconds about this great program and then I would like to see it come to our county. I've already talked to Mr. Davis about it and I've already talked to Mr. Washington shortly about this program. It's very simple. When the police are called into a home in their county and there are any children that are present in that home, the police officer sends a very quick email to a district contact and that district contact sends an email to the school where that child is located and the only thing that it says is handle with care there's no information except for that on it that email then goes to every single teacher social worker guidance counselor nurse everyone in that school that has access to that child in the morning so they know that that the child has had some kind of traumatic event in their life the night before to me, as a past administrator, that would be invaluable. I spent many years as an assistant principal, which is discipline, 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 and I just can't help but think that if we can get to these kids before they get to that office, that we would cut back on a lot of the discipline, expulsion, detentions, all of those things that go on in schools. So I am on a mission to bring this to our beautiful county and see that it gets in place. I'm working very closely with the woman, Dr. Linda Thompson, who's in charge of the Florida. It's in all of their states. It's in 23 of our counties in Florida, or I mean in Florida, so I'm hoping that Hillsboro jumps on that bandwagon. They're gonna be, she is gonna come with a team and speak um, to the Hillsboro Community Alliance Group. Um, I would be sending you an email and I hope that you can come on August 9th. The meeting runs from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock and her team will be presenting from 10.30 to 11 and she'll give you a lot more details about it. But it really is a very simple program. The bottom line is just about kindness to kids when they've had something bad happen to them. And it opens communication from the police to the schools. And being a past administrator, I have 30 seconds, um, but I, I have a PhD in curriculum and instruction, so there's no more education you can get in my world. And I never had one class on trauma all the way through my training. I think that the professional development that comes with this for the teachers is gonna be, I just think it's gonna be changing for our school. So I hope you'll join me in bringing this program, HWC Handle with Care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Gebhards, and first again, I'd like to issue an explicit content warning. Hillsborough County Schools are normalizing sex for minors. 11, 12, 13 year olds are being repeatedly exposed to explicit sexual content. They can pick up a book in one of our school libraries and read about pedophilia in casual and positive light. They can read about masochistic sex, masturbation, incestuous violent rape, um, and a handful of other things. The books describe a world that revolves around sex, and that, again, normalize these types of behavior. They chip away at personal boundaries, making children feel weird if they're not doing these things. You, as a board, are responsible for the inordinate amount of pornographic books that come into your media centers. These books are approved by your specialists who seemingly filter nothing out. 
not even this. This is a book, um, this book is gay, is the title of a book that we have in our schools by Juno Dawson. Currently, it's in the hands of a Pierce Middle School student, 11, 12 years old. Chapter nine is titled, The Ins and Outs of Gay Sex. A couple of notes on this chapter, page 199. 16 year old describes his flirtation with an older married man, the invitation then to come to his house the next day when his wife is at work so he could come help him wash the car. And eventually they went on seeing each other for months. After the section on handies, we find the section on blowies. Page 202, quote, oral sex is popping another dude's peen in your mouth, or indeed popping yours in his. There is only one hard and fast rule when it comes to blowjobs. Watch the teeth. Lips and tongue, yes, teeth, no. As with hand jobs and breakfast eggs, all men like their blowjobs served in different ways. The term blowjob is massively misleading as you won't actually be blowing on his penis. It's more about sucking. Although I stress you're not trying to suck his kidneys out through his urethra. It's more about sliding your mouth up and down on the shaft of his cock, end quote. <sighs> Bumming is the title of the next section, and I quote, it is a universal truth that many men like sticking their willies inside things. In the absence of a vagina, gay and bi men make excellent use of the back door, end quote. Normalizing sex of all sorts makes kids more susceptible, plain and simple. Following the breaking down of their boundaries, they become much more susceptible to a sex trafficking industry that preys on children and makes billions of dollars here in Hillsborough County. Could it be any more clear? This is a targeted attack on our children here in Hillsborough County. And I hope that your conscience will be bound to stand up and be a shield to the kids and families that you are elected to represent. This is poison that will forever plague a generation. As a parent, I'm robbed of my God-given freedom to teach my children the moral values that I want them to learn. And instead, the schools feed them a perverse and sick value system that exploits children. And for God's sake, why? Why would we want to normalize this? Why are we doing this? That is the million dollar question for you to answer. Why are you allowing Thank this? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. How are we doing? My name is Brett Lindbeck. I went K through 12 here in Hillsborough County Schools. My father has worked 30 plus years in Hillsborough County Schools, a few of my uh, uncles, aunts, and actually I've had an uncle that served uh, on the board not too long ago as well, so this county means a lot to me. And the reason I stand before you today is because uh, after graduating from the University of Florida in some time, I, I had some dark times even after being a student. As a matter of fact, my, my time as a student was pretty good, and uh, I, I came across a rough patch and things were tough. And I met somebody who has become my mentor who's going to speak to you after. Uh, from, he's from Boston. He moved to Tampa. And he's made a tremendous impact on my life already. And what he's been doing the past five years is actually going into schools across the country. He's been Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, Georgia, many other states. And he does an awesome mental health seminar, which I'll let him speak more on. But I think that is given, as we all know, what's happened the past few years. Um, especially last year with COVID and, and what it's done to the students. I think that it is something that we need to uh, give attention to and at least uh, hear my man Rodney out and see if there's a fit for him within, you know, middle school, high school level uh, students to come and give his seminar. So that's all I have to say. I appreciate you guys having us. And I'll introduce uh, Rodney Lavoy Jr. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Rodney Lavoie Jr. I'm from Boston. I'm sorry all of us Northerners are coming here to the great state of Florida, but uh, we want to be in paradise in the USA. And uh, I want to bring kids back to, back to home, which is into their heart and soul. And um, the last five years, I've been dedicating my life. I was on the hit TV show, Survivor. Um, and I use my platform for good to give back to the youth because I went through a really dark time, just like as, as Brett mentioned. And uh, I want to let them know that silence kills. And uh, a lot of kids since 2020 are living in silence. There's a lot of pain, and I turn my pain into passion and my passion to purpose and dedicated my life to give kids uh, the ability 
to be able to have a voice, to feed them with purpose, to feed them with love, to know that anxiety, panic attacks, depression, these are something that normally you're gonna go through, but there's always a light at the end of a very dark tunnel. And um, my purpose and mission is I lost my, my sister from a drug overdose, and I had to scrub the blood of her face with my family, and I lost my cousin from an overdose, and I dedicated my life to this purpose that if I can make an impact on one child, if I can go into an auditorium and make a kid that is going to commit suicide or complete suicide that day and get help to the guidance counselor. And what helps is that I'm young, I'm cool, I was on a TV show, the blue check, the TikTok, and all that stuff. The kids love that stuff. The guidance counselor, the principal, the superintendent, that could be a scary place to go to. So I'm the catalyst that opens them up. They see the followers, they see the blue check, they think I'm going to come in there and try to influence them in a negative way, which a lot of music, as you heard about the books and trauma specialist that she talked about before, there's a lot of trauma that's going on to the kids and I want to shed more light, shed more love, mind, body, soul, spirit, move the body more. We're in a beautiful state of sunshine, ocean. So I want to teach people and these, most important, these kids, principals, students, superintendents, how these kids can, can really combat living in silence, especially through these tough times. So that's what I'm here for. Came from Boston. I moved here three months ago. I ain't going nowhere and I'd love to make an impact here in your community. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That concludes our public comment for today. I need a motion a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Vaughn and I have a second by Member Hahn. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. The consent agenda has now been approved. I'll now call on Superintendent Davis to highlight our administrative appointments. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. This evening we have three appointments for uh, that were individuals that will transition to leadership roles. So the first one we will identify is a new leader at uh, Kimball Elementary School. This is Mrs. Carmen Harris. Uh, Carmen is, is Dr. Uh, Harris is not here this evening. She's on vacation. Congratulations. She 23 years in education. She started her career at Robles. Uh, she returned to Robles back in 2015, transitioned to uh, lead, that, lead that work as an assistant principal in the school district. She was a math coach she, uh, for, for many schools, but at the end of the day, she was an instrumental part of moving an F school to a C school this year. And congratulations, Dr. Harris, you are the new principal of Kimball Elementary School. Let's give a round of applause. And if you're watching, enjoy your vacation. We'll eventually get you walking down this catwalk. Also next, we have an opportunity to fill the position at Tampa Bay Boulevard. We know Glenda went on to take on a new role in the middle school world. We thank her for her dedication, her effort, as she's been a staple in that community. But we also have a leader that began her career in 2001 in Hillsborough County, one that uh, is, was, a, was an educator at Oak Grove Sul uh, Sullivan Partnership, was an AP in 2016 at Tampa Bay Boulevard. She's been a mentor. She's been a trainer, a resource teacher. She's great relationships, and she is now the new principal at Tampa Bay Boulevard Elementary School. That is Mrs. Michelle Perez. Congratulations to you. We're one point away from a V, right? We need that one point for next year. No pressure. Congratulations. Also, we have an opportunity to, uh, to transition to identify a leader that's been in Hillsborough County for the last 11 years. Uh, started her career, was a, been in elementary uh, school, been in middle school as an educator, but uh, was an AP at, at She High, and I believe an AP at the same time at uh, Van Burden Middle School. She has been a, uh, at many different levels at elementary and middle school. She has been the assistant principal at Woodson K-8 currently. They moved uh, the school from a D to a C with a 154-point gain. She is a great leader, a great educator, and this is Mrs. Lippy Data reed Congratulations. You're the new principal of Woodson K-8. Oh, they can come take a picture then. If they want to take a picture, they're more than welcome. <coughs> she said, my parents are here. I'm like, okay. Listen, I know how it goes. My mom will be texting me during board meeting like, what'd you say? You know, why'd you say that? <laughs> I'm like, okay, mom. <laughs> I have to hear about it all the way home. Congratulations. Enjoy. Mom, thanks for being here. And uh, that's it. Three leaders. Congratulations to each of you. Look forward to, uh, you know, 
helping you in this process and know that you're not alone. Everybody in this room is here to support you. Everybody in this board supports you. Leaders are supporting you. So we look forward to being uh, partners and game changers as we continue to accelerate uh, opportunities for our children. Have a good night and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Combs. Yes, congratulations to all of you um, for all your hard work. I know enjoy the last couple of weeks. I'm sure you're going to be working very hard throughout the year. And congratulations to all three leaders, as well as all our new administrative assignments as well. So I'll just give you guys a couple minutes if everybody wants to leave, unless you want to stay for this meeting, you know. <laughs> Okay, we will now move on to the following items will now be heard. C604, C605, C606, C607, C612, C614, C702, C706, C901, and C1002. 604, contract between the Agency for Community Treatment Incorporated, ACTS, and the School Board of Hillsborough County. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. The Chair, we are statutorily required to be able to offer DJJ services to our students in, in our community that, that have uh, pressing needs. So the next couple items will be in the, in the same scope of what we do and what we offer. The first one is community treatment. This is all about residential program for uh, students in our, in our school district. It's up to 12 students. These are all openly for uh, males, uh, adolescents who have been, uh, that have abused alcohol and or drugs. And just as ongoing resources to be able to help them thrive and to be successful and get back on track educationally. And also uh, to have additional wraparound services while they're there to be able to, to make certain they continue to make informed and right decisions in the future. This is fully funded. I mean, this is funded by and generated by FTE by students. So uh, currently we have between, you fluctuate between eight and nine students that are currently on site and they have the capacity to go up to 12. This is a $125,000 expenditure and we use uh, general funds to be able to, um, <clears throat> to pay for this. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C604. I have a motion by Member Hahn and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 605, contact, uh, contract between AMI Kids, Tampa Incorporated, and the School Board of Hillsborough County, Florida. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. Chair, this is AMI Kids. This is a partnership that we provide uh, for our male students in middle school and high school in the secondary level, just who may need uh, additional services to be able to, once again, get back on track. Uh, this is all about providing instructional intervention. This is about interaction, counseling, uh, student, ba uh, student therapy, behavior therapy, career opportunities. This is up to 44 students that AMI, AMI Kids offer. And this is a $217,000 uh, expenditure using general fund. But once again, it's paid, with full, it's paid and fully funded by uh, FTE from our students that are enrolled in this particular initiative. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C605. I have a motion by Member Press and I have a second by Member Hahn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Item 606, contract between AMI Kids, yes, and the School Board of Hillsborough County, Florida. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. the Chair. A this is our contract and agreement with AMI Kids, yes. This is a 240-day residential dropout prevention opportunity for our students. This is up to serves up to 32 boys that are definitely in need and that have been identified by the courts that need additional supervision and supports. This is all about mental health supports for our students within our community. So once again, this is FTE generated from, our, uh, from, uh, from students that transition to these facilities and continue to provide ongoing wraparound services through case management services or any additional services outlined by the judicial system. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C606. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? 
Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 607, contract between Pace Center for Girls, Hillsborough County, Pace, and the School, um, School Board of Hillsborough County, Florida. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Madam Chair, this is our long-lasting relationship with PACE, which is a PACE Center for Girls, which is identified as a treatment preventative measure for females uh, that provide a, a holistic approach for them that may have experienced trauma. So what PACE does is they identify up to 75 students, uh, females that are at risk, and provide ongoing wraparound services to allow them to, to reach successful um, outcomes. This is once again uh, identified by the courts in, in our relationship with Hillsborough County and will continue to make sure that the service is available. This is a $617,000 expenditure that we use general funds to provide these services and it's also generated by FTE. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-607. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 612, purchase of iReady reading and mathematics instruction, diagnostic and teacher toolbox for grades K through five for, from curriculum associates. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is a, a long time supplemental material has been used in Hillsborough County. One thing that, uh, you know, two and a half years ago coming in, being able to expand this initiative, not only by using the the electronic platform, but also expanded to make certain that every one of our schools had accessibility to the toolkit, which really allows our, our teachers to differentiate instruction and, and have additional resources to help students and scaffold the, the instructional process. But this comes with a literacy and mathematic and, and instructional uh, guide with diagnostics and also the teacher toolkit. Uh, you know, we've looked at this to determine whether or not the overall effectiveness to determine whether or not usage was there, whether or not teachers feel that they would need this as we transition to a new uh, curriculum and new standards. Uh, in this survey, a number of students, a number of teachers were surveyed in the school district. 79% of the teachers responded that they would like to keep iReady for next year, knowing there may be, there, there is going to be a new progress monitoring system. And 90% of the teachers say that they use this product 45 minutes a week and this could be used uh, before during or after school this is just another platform for supplement materials and we really determine and look closely to determine whether or not we could selectively abandon this initiative however we've seen the gains in with our with our schools over the last two years and where we are uh, academically and we believe that going into a new year with new standards we the teachers really wanted some type of stability and what this brings as a supplement of material stability and comfort for our teachers as they figure out with you know how they interact with the with a new content new curriculum and new standards, this will give them stability in that process to be able to leverage in small group or allow, leverage for independent practice. Uh, this is a, a $3.8 million expenditure. This is, we have leveraged SAI dollars, which is used to do so. This is supplemental academic instructional dollars. Um, this is a decrease of $600,000 uh, from last year. So working to renegotiate contracts and expand down. And I'll lean to uh, Mr. Connor if he wants to add anything related to, um, to this particular item. No, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, like the superintendent said, we really, from the district point of view, believe that this is a resource that is beneficial to teachers, but we came from an agnostic point of view and wanted to hear from the teachers. And so when we administered the survey, we had a great response of 1,500 teachers respond to the survey. And like the superintendent said, 79% believe in light of the changes, pending changes with the uh, state assessment that they felt that this resource is something they had comfort with, that the resources were valuable to them and knowing that they're aligned to the new uh, best standards, that this is something they would continue to, uh, to utilize. And, and as was stated previously, 90% of our teachers use this on a regular basis to differentiate instruction. Uh, and the tools and resources there are very valuable, not only for the teacher, but specifically to meet students at their instructional level. Uh, one thing we know about the progress monitoring assessment from the state is that it will be fixed form adaptive, meaning that it will only adjust at the grade level uh, that the student is currently in, where the iReady program will adjust forwards and backwards so that if a student is two grade levels behind they can be provided direct uh, differentiated instruction on where they're at instructionally 
and that gives teachers a little more specific targeted data to help students uh, at their particular point of need. So we do feel as a district that this uh, resource will be very supportive in meeting the needs of our students and the comfort level with our teachers in light of all the new that is coming this, this current year. Thank you. I need, a, I need a motion a second to approve item C612. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Perez. Member Vaughn and I pulled this item Member Vaughn, you can start. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, this item was something that was a challenge for me to really make a decision on because, you know, I've had a lot of negative feedback about iReady. As someone who's been in the classroom, I've seen students kind of game it and figure out how to, you know, make it more like a video game and respond to things on the computer. And then when you sit down and you actually look at their fluency, it's nowhere near what they're testing in iReady. Um, and so I decided to, you know, really reach out to a lot of the teachers that I know and get some feedback because although I appreciate the survey I did get feedback that because it was kind of done at the end of the year um, people weren't able to engage in it they had a lot of other things to do getting their classrooms cleared out doing a lot of moving that they would have preferred a survey like this at a time where they could have engaged more but surprisingly enough um, when I reached out to my teacher friends and in different groups and got a lot of feedback personally they sounded like they didn't want to keep this this uh, the, the iReady that with the new things coming down the line um, they wanted something that they could count on that they had familiarity with um, so um, based on that feedback I think I'm going to support this item so I just want to share that with other board members thank you thank you member Vaughn um, you know I, I was fortunate enough that I was able to talk to Dr. Binder for a long time as well as iReady I know that iReady as a product in itself is a, is a good product and teachers want it my biggest concern is the amount of diagnostic testing that's happening to our students the amount you know we are now testing we will begin testing students in kindergarten and a lot of students maybe have not had those experiences maybe don't have access to computers so my concern is the amount of testing that's occurring at every grade level especially when you're looking at grade level three four and five and I am going to support this because I think that's what the teachers want but I also think after we look at this year and we see at the amount of testing then we're going to have to really reevaluate Evaluated. I would hope that iReady could be adaptive at some point where you can log on and as you do your work it can kind of put you on the grade level I guess for for my question to you superintendent Davis is um, is this diagnostic test going to be truly optional for teachers or is it you're just saying optional but the area superintendents are going to push for it to not be optional so I guess that's what I'm looking for 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 is it truly optional Yes, ma'am. Through, through the chair, we, we want this to be an option for teachers. If they believe there's value in this process to have that diagnostic, to be able to, to allow children to work through a particular um, subset of content uh, related, uh, connected to iReady, we want that to be that availability to, to have them. We're not going to force that. We, we don't know enough about the progress monitoring assessment to um, to determine whether or not additional assessments are needed. We want to test less. So, you know, we're going to put our stock into the new assessment system from the state, but allow this to have an opportunity where teachers feel that this has been a game changer for them and their students and give them freedom to do so. I, and I guess my, I just want to know that the, the area superintendents are going to yeah. be given yes, that, you know, that to say to each principal, each assistant principal, that this is truly, truly optional and not mandatory. Yes, ma'am, to the chair, it's optional. Okay, and then my other question or comment is really to be able to really take a deep dive and do a true tech audit for every single school and look at the amount of technology programs we have, the amount of time that is spent on each program, how much students are using that, and so that would be my request. We've talked about that, but I really would like to see that for each individual school because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't beat a person in front of you teaching, and I want to make sure that kids are not just on technology constantly, that we're spending tens of millions of dollars on technology, because we need to focus on primarily the teacher. Because when you see the schools that are moving, they're moving because of the teachers. They're not moving. Sure, the technology is supporting that, but what's moving them is actually the teacher. So I just want to be assured of that with, you know, by approving iReady, I just want to make sure that that's correct. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. Um, so, I, you know, I share obviously some, uh, very similar concerns being a teacher in the classroom and supervising teachers over many, many years. 
Um, got a lot of feedback, both pro and con, over the years. So, you know, I also was on the phone last week and actually a lot today getting feedback. Um, you know, and I, I also heard that teachers want it. And I think to the superintendent's point, a point that this is a transitional year and, um, you know, this is something that we haven't received a technical paper from the state, as far as I know, on what to expect from the new assessment. Um, there's a lot, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of implications for teachers regarding state assessments. They're affected a great deal with their evaluations and so forth. So I can understand why they, during a transition year, they would want to continue with this to capture some information. Um, I'm glad that Member Combs asked for you to speak about the optional, uh, because that that's a huge piece of it, right? And um, and I think teachers need a lot of tools in their toolbox. If this is something they feel is going to support them in some way, then uh, I'm glad we can provide it. Um, I would be interested in the utilization data um, next year. If there is an ability to do that, some programs have the ability to capture yeah how many times people signed on and how many people and so forth. Um, you know, that might that would be inform next year's decision around this piece, and I'm sure we'll get more great feedback. So um, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Perez? You know, um, sticking to the iReady program, I understand that when we c keep on changing programs year after year, the teachers do not have the opportunity to become skilled with a program. And, you know, it, it ends up not just frustrating the teachers, but also just messing up the data that the teachers provide, you know, in order to make sure that our students are progressing. So for me, to be able to hold on to a program longer than two years, is you know the best when I spoke to the teachers, their feedback to me was that they wanted to hold on to it, and for me, I believe as a board member, part of our responsibility is also not to overwhelm the teachers with more programs for them to learn. When we're talking about them focusing on our students in the classroom, part of that also is ensuring that they're. We're not piling more things on their plate to have to learn new things over programs that we already have established. So for me, that's you know part of the reasons why I would I'm, I'm going to um, support this because you know our teachers need a steady train coming down the track not something that looks like it's going to derail every time they get a steady course in their classroom. Thank you, Member Press. Member Washington? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also uh, support, I want to support the iReady program because I'm very familiar with it, being a former administrator. And also, you know, if the teachers feel comfortable about it, uh, we got to do everything we can to make them feel more comfortable than they are now because we don't know what the, we don't know what, about the new assessment that's coming out. So I agree. I want to uh, let them keep it. They feel comfortable with it. The teachers that I spoke to, they were very comfortable and they wanted to keep it. So I uh, I go with I ready. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 614, addendum number six, master agreement with Hillsborough County Public Schools succeed LLC, a wholly owned subsidiary of MGT of America Consulting LLC for external operator services. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Uh, through the chair, we are uh, we are special required to be able to extend a, a partnership with an external operator for schools that may need additional assistance. You know, last year we had eight schools that needed additional assistance. Right now we have four that are required by the state. Those schools are James, McDonald, Robles, and uh, SSK8. Uh, all these schools have shown significant growth. James went from an F to a C this year. We had McDonald move from a D to a C. Robles moved from an F to a C. And Silver Springs uh, K8 moves from an F to a C as well. 
So what we want to do is continue this continued partnership with MGT that has helped us uh, not only with the eight schools, but these four schools be very intentional about our work. What this brings is a director. It brings uh, transformational specialists. It brings uh, content coaches, a data analytics lead, all to continue to make certain there are systems that are in place um, along the way. So in the other four schools they historically have worked through is uh, we're looking at determining if there's a need for systemic, um, you know, uh, systemic movement with that and bringing it back to the board potentially with be Folsom, Foster, Kimball, and Oak Park, all that have shown the necessary gains uh, within our school district with MGT. And, and this goes to uh, Shay McRae and her team have been remarkable in this work over the last two and a half years, you know, with, uh, you know, Rachel O'Day, with Shay, with, with Star Connor, with Rick Grays and April Gilliard. They have been magnificent with concentrating on this work. So hats off to them and just bringing the, continuing that partnership for year three, which allows us to continue to have stability in a very difficult year. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C614. I have a motion by Member Hahn and a second by Member Washington. Okay, Mem Member Vaughn and I pull this item. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious because we've had a lot of movement in our transformation schools. Congratulations, that's amazing. Um, and I was looking through this contract here and I don't really see where we're determining real life what they're contributing to help us move the needle like as you mentioned a lot of this work is attributed to the teachers in the school to you know the people in our district who's doing this and I'm just trying to figure out I mean I, I kind of see you know what our responsibilities are and what their responsibilities are but what are we doing to actually capture data to see for the amount of money that we're paying for them to come in and provide support whether that's actually worth the value of what we're paying them so that's a good question. Contractually, one of the things that we have in our agreement is that every week they submit exactly what's happening in every single school. They do have academic coaches that are pushing into the schools. There is a turnaround specialist that's working with the administrators. And so each week they submit to Hillsborough County exactly what was done, what teachers they were working with. Um, when we have um, data sets, they really analyze the data. They sit down and have data analysis session. And all of those things are tracked uh, through MGT. They are provided to the district for us to review and then our region soups work in partnership with MGT so that that work is succinct with what we are doing as a district so it doesn't feel like a separate entity doing the work but it really feels like a partnership in the work so that is something that is monitored and tracked and they do provide that uh, evidence every single week in writing we get those uh, every single Friday okay um can I get a sample of that just to, to get an idea and the the next thing I just wanted to ask about was um, I know we've had a lot of uh, transition in our schools between leadership and administrative appointments um, and some of the feedback that I've gotten is that with some of the outside consultants um, in the schools um, if there's a new administrator that it seems like the consultant is kind of leading <laughs> leading the charge on on you know the strategies to move those schools and and kind of overshadowing the administration and what are the roles and scope as far as that's concerned to make sure that it's more collaborative and, and, and no one's leading that work in a way where it's overshadowing each other? One of the unique features um, that we do in transformation, we call it our onboarding process. So anytime we have an exit of one administrator and the entrance of another, we sit down at the table with both administrators, the exiting principal and the principal that's entering. We also bring district representatives from HR, from Title I, partners that are helping support that work from a district perspective. And we really have a thoughtful meeting around what are the things that we're already working in a school and that we're doing well, because we want to sustain that. We don't want to come in and and be a disruptor and disrupt the work that's already happening. We also identify gaps. With the external partner, a lot of times, in the case of MGT, they have been consistent partners over the last three years. So in some cases, they are the stable entity that has been happening at some of those schools. So they also come and they sit down in that partnership. So it should never feel like an outside partner is leading the work but collectively as a group, we're discussing the work, we're talking about what's happening and what's working well, we're talking about what can be done to close the gap, whether it's student achievement, leadership, teacher practice, and then we're really sitting down and coming up with a collective plan. In transformation, every school has an action plan. It is something that is created at the school level, but it is monitored by the school. It is reviewed and practiced with that external partner, and it is something that the regional superintendent is monitoring, and we are capturing high 
high level macro actions, things that we are doing that's moving the needle. And we don't just capture the action. We go back and say, what's the evidence that supports that what we say we're going to do is actually happening? What does that look like? And so all three entities, the school, the external operator, and the region soup are all capturing that evidence. And we're all in alignment with what's happening at a school. So it should very much feel in succinct, and if it's not, that's something that the school should have a conversation with the region soup about. And, and I think in the last three years, we or like two and a half years, we've really focused on making certain that MGT or any external operator doesn't come in and, and tell someone what to do, how to do, when to do it. Because, I mean, you get to that point where, you know, that relationship becomes very odd between a staff and his or her leader and their assistant principal. So one thing that when we initiated this contract a couple of years ago, we sat at the table and we were very clear about how this must be in a collaborative effort in, in, in order to move forward. And, and we've done just that. There's a lot of push and pulls, a lot of uh, behind closed doors conversations. And, and it's all about being able to, to build the capacity of, of our teachers at the same t token, leveraging the best practices to duplicate it within our schools. And I had one last question. Do you feel like you're taking the strategies from these schools and building them into strategies that we use in our transformation schools that aren't using uh, an outside agency such as this? I mean, do you feel like you've been beneficial in taking these strategies and building them into just the core of what we do as well? Yes, I do believe we've been doing that. So if there are practices that are happening in schools that we deem are positive, whether they have an external operator or not, we've been doing a really good job of having some demonstrations of practice. And so we'll take principles and groups that are focusing on the same goals. And if we have evidence of great practice happening, we'll go to that school together and we do learning walks together. And in those learning walks, we're identifying what are those activities, what are those strategies, what are those action steps that we actually see evidence of in the building how do we name it, how do we call it out, and then how do we think about implementation in their own school site in a way that makes sense for their school. So that is something that we practice in transformation. We do a really good job of sharing, and we have our leaders just talk about those great things that are happening in their school sites. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Perez? So is there any way that we can receive a summary like um, six months worth maybe of the the goals and strategies that were that were used and that it took to get these schools from where they were to where they are now and I have a question is how long are these schools under MGT because you were mentioning that James McDonald Robles and Stefan are doing uh, good they're doing better so what is the goal grade for the school before MGT bows out and allows the school to move forward on their own I'm just curious so one thing we don't want to do is is in the state did it right is they don't want to have a blitz in with a number of service resources to a school and that school move and make drastic gains and they pull those external operators out so they want them to have two or more years of systemic C grades or higher where there's continued work that's demonstrated. And what they want the external operator to come in and do is openly help putting systems and processes in place, systems of how you lead your leadership team, systems of how you review analytical data, systems of how you leverage uh, curriculum guides, how do you leverage interventions, how do you engage your community. All of those uh, elements are in the forefront of our work. So it, this is about sustainability and, um, you know, because these schools make great gains this year. We want them to be systemic in a way that Foster and Oak Park have been for the last two years and continue to provide ongoing supports. Ms. McCray, anything else? Is there a start over if you place a new principal in that school? Do they start that process all over again or they they? No, ma'am. It's it's based on school grade. So you know they look at students they, in in that process and their performance. So nothing to do with leadership. Now the state will review any school that's underperforming. And they will have to approve any principal or you know they go into those schools and they have to have a proven track record of moving schools within a district or throughout the state of Florida. 
um, and we have to have and send verification forms for that to happen. I will tell you in the last two years we've uh, created a, a greater bench of individuals that have systemically moved schools that have greater eligibility to be able to go to a underperforming school and the good thing is is we're working ourselves out of business and Shay out of a job but uh, she does great job you know great work of eliminating DNF schools and uh, she's uh, I'm proud of her and her team. Thank you, Member Press. I just wanted to say, I know that we're talking about having a workshop on really looking at each grade and kind of going down and looking at every grade and how we've improved. I guess one of my requests would be, as we move towards that workshop, I'd love to know which one of those had an external operator and what the history of each of those are. So we can see, are there schools that moved without the external operator? Are there schools that moved? Is LSI moving kids more? Is MGT moving? Just to kind of look at, and also really looking at the difference of the operators, who's more effective, who's not more effective, and what it looks like. So that's just a request as we move towards that workshop to look at that as well. That's the only thing I had. And through the chair, the, right now we only have data from MGT. So LSI will start for next year. So okay, we'll so we'll, uh, with MGT, which schools, because there are yep. some schools that we really moved that maybe didn't have an external operators to look at that, because I'd ri really like to see what really is moving that, you know, is it iReady, is it external operator, is it that principal, is it, the, you know, there's so many factors in that to really be able to an take a deeper analysis of that. Okay. Please vote when your lights appear, if there's no other further comments. And it passes unanimously. 702, Third Amendment to Primico, Primico, Personal Communications, Site Lease. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is just a renewal of a contract that's been in place, I believe, since 1997, where there's been uh, uh, cell towers on three of our sites. So just bringing that board, bring that back to the board for a uh, you know renewal contract with opportunity to renew every five years. Um, this is a, you know brings our schools starting at thirty-two thousand dollars per each school. Historically, there's been a breakdown between one hundred percent going back to the school, but now there'll be in the last three years. It's a yeah, of the money, the thirty-two thousand dollars that goes to the school. There's a seventy percent that goes to the school and thirty percent that goes back into the general fund for the property. And uh, that money is being able to use uh, the school as they wish, and the 30% goes back in the general fund for us to be able to leverage resources at scale within the within the school district. Um, this is uh, since '97. There's been uh, we've had n no one c complain related to uh, this process, and uh, just bringing it back for uh, additional revenues opportunities within our district. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C702. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by, by Member Hahn. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, thank you. Um, recently I was at a forum where we were talking about school board issues, and somebody brought up concerns about the safety of these towers. Um, and there were some questions back and forth about whether the district has done any kind of study on the safety, if these are cancer causing, if we have any concerns. And I'd like to know if we've done a study and what we found and what that looks like. Mr. Farkas. Sure. Thank you. The district has not done a study, but the Cancer Society of America and a bunch of other ones have. We can provide that to the board, make sure that you have that information uh, so you can make a sound decision. But there is no correlation right now they found even if you go to the American Cancer Society website cancer.org uh, there's a that's one of the front page articles on that but I'll make sure we share that data with the school district with the board members and do you know what year that was done 2020 was the last one that I saw okay. on cancer.org and just to clarify I mean we said this this money funds goes directly to the schools that are hosting the towers on their sites correctly I mean correctly correct thank you thank you member Vaughn member Perez Thank you, Member Vaughn, for asking that question. Um, so the money that goes from these towers to the schools, Superintendent, what does that help with for the schools? Yes, Mr. Chair, whatever the school believes they, they need to support, whether it be incentives, whether it be to purchase awnings, whether it be to purchase uh, spirit T-shirts, whether it's field experiences, field trips, Whatever the school and their leadership team deems that they meet, they may need to address any financial gaps to be whether it could be uh, additional resources for their teachers. So they, they use that and leverage that money in, in many ways. And uh, you know we know it's hard to be able to generate and raise money in particular schools. So this is just another way for them to be able to have accessibility to funds to help them uh, fulfill their mission at their schools. 
Thank you, Member Perez. Member Washington? Uh, uh, Superintendent, I got a question uh, because I recall back in 2005, we had a tower put on Milton High School in that area over there. <clears throat> or do we, how long do they receive money for those towers? Do you, can you? Yeah, through, through the chair, my understanding that through these three, it's annually. I don't know anything. Uh, can you talk about Milton? There are, every place we have a cell tower gets an annual payment. Okay. Um, but there are leases that come up. So we may have signed at Middleton. I'll, I'll find out for you, uh, Mr. Washington. But we may have signed a 10 or 15 year lease. We now have a consultant that kind of is trying to bring those together so you see them less often and they're more cyclical. Uh, but I'll make sure I look at Middleton and see what they have. But it doesn't ever end. As long as there's a cell tower on the site, the school is funded for that cell tower. Okay, because this is an excessive amount compared to what I received. I know. Uh, we're we're trying. We're trying to make sure they get the. Thank you, Member Washington. Well, that's because the cell phone bills go up, right? <laughs> um, yes, ma'am, data bill. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 706 tentative 2022 2023 facilities five year work plan. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. We're statutory required to make certain that we have a five year forecast of, uh, for our work plan within our school district. And this really addresses any major repairs, any renovations, any newly planned construction. It looks at class size usage, portable. Um, portable classrooms that we may need within the school district, and it unpacks. And this looks at uh, you know, new schools that will be coming on board. As you know, we have Manhattan K-8 that was coming on board in 2024. And then we also have our new high school in the Westlake area that's on this evening that will come in 2025, and that's a property that will hold a number of schools as well. So this gives a, an update to the board and to the community about all the repairs that we will address from from painting to plumbing, you name it, it continues. And if anything comes on board that's an emergency, that we will revisit this plan and keep the board apprised of any particular changes that may uh, need to be made. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion a second to approve item C706. I have a motion by Member Perez and I have a second by Member Hahn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 901 approval, I'm, I'm sorry, 901 approval of 2021 22 annual education equity update. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. We're professionally required to make certain we bring a report annually to the board for review uh, due to the fact that the Office of Equity Educational Opportunity will review a number of elements to make sure we're in compliance with the FEEA um, uh, mindset that really makes certain that we prohibit any type of discrimination within this organization. In that process, there are seven areas that they continue to look at with this report. It's through civil rights policies. It's through um, uh, pending action, advanced coursework, it's through athletics, uh, employment data, single school gender data, and then anything related to pregnancy and parenting uh, education along the way. So what this report does, it identifies areas of opportunities uh, for school districts and also celebrates some, some cool things that school districts are doing to address this. We do see there's two areas of opportunities that we will, we will focus on um, within our school district. That first area is completely focused on um, uh, eliminating the uh, gap related to the number of students of color that are in advanced coursework. We do see that we did make some marginal strides, and this goes back and looks at a five-year span. So looking at um, what happened in 2017, 2018 compared to where we are in 21, 22. And you'll see, when you look at advanced coursework, you'll see that we increase the number of white males, the number of uh, black students overall, the number of Hispanic students, Hispanic males, and ELL students have moved the needle in a positive manner for the uh, being exposed to advanced coursework. And advanced coursework could be linked to, a, to AP courses, IB courses, dual enrollment courses, ACE courses along the way. Um, we still have work to do. We still have overall work to do in making certain that, that black males are continue to have accessibility to accelerated courses. The great thing is, is that 14 high schools in Hillsborough County next year will offer ACE. So that, that motions uh, a greater opportunity for accessibility and coursework. And we continue to make certain that we are doing and conducting master schedule reviews annually and, and during this time and beginning of the year to make certain that students who can and 
and are willing to have the accessibility to be pushed intellectually into courses. So um, we know that, that while we've seen marginal movement in these particular areas, we have work to do and we're committed to that. And I thank Dr. Houghton and her team and, and all of our, our team members, cabinet members, for being in the forefront. The second area that we have to really focus on is really looking at the, uh, you know, our hiring practices to make certain that not only are we looking at site-based and district-based administrators and teachers and school counselors, but we need to do a better job to make certain that the in these particular areas that our workforce really truly mirrors the student uh, population that we serve along the way. There is a major gap in that process, and uh, we put a number of uh, uh, proactive solutions in place related to Latinos in action, making certain that we have Hispanic forums, uh, looking at redesigning our, our principal pipeline. Uh, this year we have more individuals of color in that pipeline as well for leadership roles. But we've got to do, do our due diligence from a recruiting mechanism to make certain that um, when we uh, hire for our school district, whether it be for support staff, whether it be for district staff, teachers, uh, paraprofessionals, food, nutrition, bus drivers, that openly that our children know that they can, they can go to work, uh, school every single day and they have someone that looks like them and they have accessibility to have mentors every single day within, within our forefront. So this report, uh, those are the two areas we'll continue to focus on. We have work to do. The cabinet's uh, committed to do that and um, just want to bring that to the attention. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C901. I have a motion by Member Hahn, and I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do. Thank you. Um, I've had a lot of conversations about this document. So thank you for providing some of the follow-up to a lot of the questions I asked. And I'm glad you highlighted those two areas because those were ones I had the biggest amount of questions in, specifically when we're talking about how to identify you know, our most marginalized students to make sure that they're getting enrolled in the advanced coursework and the opportunities that we have. Um, one of the things that I know we had talked about was that AVID was a doorway to that and that we thought we had that. And all of our middle schools and high schools and I see here in the follow-up data that there's two schools or three schools who have declined to have AVID is that correct based on that who's that going to we have one oh. high school and three middle schools that don't currently have it and which middle schools are those don't have that with me uh, right now, but I can find But you can send that to me. Um, and then so in lieu of that, since that was kind of the explanation of one of the tools that we're using to make sure that we're meeting that goal, what are we doing in those schools that feel that that's not a good fit in placement of that? So we continue to look at master schedule reviews. So the master schedule reviews will identify the number of students that um, have accessibility to advanced coursework. So in that process, we run analytics not only in the during the summer, but also in the first 10 days and also the second before the second semester ends to determine uh, the overall percentage of students. And we also look and couple that with school grades and look at FSA and EOC data also as well to determine whether or not a, uh, we can push students who um, that may be on that marginal area to be exposed to that process. So we'll go back to every one of our schools and determine whether or not, uh, you know, why AVID is not an opportunity. We think AVID's a great strategy, and uh, we'll get that to the board and determine whether or not if it's, uh, you know, the rationale why those schools do not currently carry it. Is it an allocation issue? Is it a, de a desired issue? Is it a basic not understanding that, it, that initiative? Because that initiative has really done a really good job taking students who are just, in, in, I mean, indirectly in on the bubble of moving from good to great and exposing them to another a number of resources to allow them to be successful and when you say we who, who does that responsibility fall on to are you talking about the counselors at the schools talking about the APs who build it who, who's checking that identifying it and then contacting those students who's we Yes, this is through, I mean, this is teachers, this is school counselors, this is administration, this is regional superintendents, this is, this is everybody inclusive of the school makeup. So, you know, this is also staff from academic services that they sit on uh, the reviews for master schedules. All those are inclusive of that process of looking at academic histories. Do we offer any kind of training for staff members or teachers who would be interested in helping identify and transitioning students like who would be a good fit for this into that? Do we offer any of those kinds of trainings, optional or whatnot? Absolutely. So this year uh, we offered the AVID Summer Institute right here in Tampa. We offered it at the Convention Center. We trained over 250 of our teachers. 
Uh, it is a great opportunity when principals, you know, when teacher changes occur throughout the school year or uh, they don't have the right fit, it's an opportunity during these institutes to expose some teachers that could be potential good fits for that to go to the institute. Also, our accelerated um, programs team here in academic services works very closely with the schools, and we have coordinators that are out at the sites on a daily basis that are helping support that program. And then, of course, they're recruiting and, and identifying teachers that could potentially be a, a great fit for that program. So they're committed to, um, to getting to 100% on those schools, and we're close to that. Like I said, we have uh, over 75 secondary schools with only four that currently do not have AVID programs and we'll work to, to close that gap. But um, in far, as far as training, um, not only with AVID, in, uh, we have our Cambridge Summer Institute that we hosted this year with 200 participants as we launch out the new 14 uh, schools that will be implementing that. We had over 200 participants in our uh, accelerated program um, Summer Institute at USF for advanced placement in the College Board for all of our AP coursework. So there's plenty of opportunities out there, and we also identify mentors that we pay an additional stipend to at each of the high school levels to mentor potential AP teachers um, or current AP teachers who may be new to the program. Um, so any avenue that we can take to support these teachers, we're going we're gonna to find that and dedicate our time to that. So in within, because the number one thing that you mentioned was AVID over the summer, within that you're saying that there there's training specifically for looking at and reaching out to and recruiting marginalized students, whether it's students of color who aren't traditionally in our advanced placement, whether it's a socioeconomic gap. You're saying with embedded in that training is tools and techniques aimed to help support teachers and staff to identify and get students into our accelerated programs? That is absolutely the mission of AVID is to look at that first generation college student that has, may not have that external support, maybe uh, their parents didn't go to college and they don't have that family uh, environment that has been, that knows how to navigate those waters to mm -hmm. uh, prepare for college. That is what AVID uh, does, that's their mission. So when they go to these trainings, that is exactly what they're doing to identify who are the best fits in the school that can benefit from that. And typically it is a first generation college student. That, that is kind of the ripe candidate for a program like this. And then I guess lastly, my question would be is, so that helps us with identifying at school, you know, the next piece is how do we get it on the radar of the families who would need support or parents who would advocate if they feel like their student would be a good fit for this or even be able to take advantage of that. And I know a lot of what was provided in this was with, you know, FACE and, and things that they provide. But I'm wondering, you know, off of this, I, I know we have to submit this to the state and that's fine, but, you know, can we do something to make face more accessible, to make this information more accessible, to get more information out to our families. Is there a plan to do that is, I guess, my final question. Thank you. Yes, prior to COVID, there were, uh, we had several of our in-person, um, what we call parent universities that we conducted um, with our accelerated programs team. And we did those. Fortunately, we have a Spanish speaking leader of that division and has personally been out to inform the community about that. COVID did put a damper on that because we transitioned to more virtual sessions and of course participation waned a little bit during the last two years. So that is a focus moving into this year is to continue to push forward with in-person, do multiple trainings, do uh, various languages is, is the best we can, we can do, um, and then take every opportunity with our FACE department to, to connect uh, in as many avenues as we can. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Um, and I just had a couple questions and comments. Um, I know with this report, I think it, it's very comprehensive and, and it provides a lot of details. And I, and, I, and I appreciate all the translation of really moving things in Spanish and making sure at least that everything is in Spanish in almost all of our posts and everything like that. Um, and Superintendent Davis, I think you've made like remarkable moves um, when you look at the number of black 
principals, assistant principals, teachers, and really the number of students represented is almost equal. If not, I think the assistant principals might even be a couple percentage points up. And I know we're working hard towards the Hispanic, but I just, I, I can't, you know, I can't go past this without just remembering the importance of that because we are really double digits behind when we look at the Hispanic from the principals to the assistant principals when 38% of our, our students are Hispanic and when then we have like a 10 or 11% as administrators. So I know that you're continuing and this is work that has probably been years in the, in the making that needed to come and I just want to keep continuing to remind and talk about that and I know we're doing Hispanic forums. We have a, a meeting tomorrow and we continue to do things um, and if you want to continue to talk a little bit about your plan and some of the things that you're doing to move that, I would appreciate it. You know, th we, this is, you're exactly right, Mr. Chair. We have got to do a better job of, of making certain that we identify uh, talent in the Hispanic uh, realm. And, you know, we, you know, we got to a point where we're encouraging more leaders to transition to uh, the principal leadership. Uh, this is a, this is the high, the greatest year of uh, the no higher highest number we've had in many years. The number of Hispanics that are in our principal pipeline, and we'll continue to make certain that we are leaning on Hispanic leaders within this community to identify what we can do to recruit and retain, and also make certain that we celebrate culture within it, within our school district. Um, Melissa Magado has been awesome in that process to to link the the resources. But as you see tonight, we're going to be committed to putting leaders in positions to allow them to have have an opportunity to to serve because as you said majority of our students are Hispanic and we've got to really tr truly pay attention of it so we'll continue to make certain it's a priority this entire year and years to come because uh, you know we have got to uh, continue to, to make strides in this particular area thank you and I, I do believe that you're committed and I see that you're making strides all the way across and I just want to thank you for that and we need we have a long way to go but we, we are going to all work together to do that member Perez Thank you, um, Chair Combs. So I was having a conversation with a couple of our staff this afternoon. And 90 to 99% of our Hispanic staff are the janitorial staff. And, you know, so when our Latino students see themselves, that's the message that we're sending. Um, and we really need to um, step it up here in this, in this district, to be honest. Um, how often do we promote our staff or encourage them to, or provide the, the um, education for them to get promoted within the ranks of Hillsborough County Schools? Question number one. Yes, ma'am. We every single day. We, you know, when when jobs come open, when we see individuals internally that are that are working hard, that have and, and lead with the core values of our organization, we want them to be inspired to be able to apply for any type of promotions. We will in no way, shape, or form ever stifle a promotion for any of our employees, but we want them to be dedicated to that process, and and, and we will continue to identify top talent every single day. So from, from our side of it, we have a number of initiatives from Pair to Pro initiative, which is really moving individuals that are in the support realm to the professional certificator realm. And then the, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, I hired a principal, I think it was two weeks ago, that started as a paraprofessional and now she was identified as a principal last our, our last meeting and you know she was a model for this work so we continue to do that through human resources and continue to identify every single day talent that we can move from one phase to the next uh, you know with building their capacity and leveraging their knowledge to be successful within our district so just like our students that are ELL you know a lot of our um, staff who are Latino are their um, native, you know, language is um, Spanish, and very limited English. So, what supports do we have in place here in Hillsborough County Schools to support those employees to help elevate them, you know, um, here in the in the district to move them along in you know in moving through through the district um, ladder. Yeah, we, we have ongoing supports with, with all of our district. I mean, with every every employee in this district, you know, regardless of, of who they are, you know, we 
continue to make certain they fully understand their scope and their sequence of their work, make certain they understand their job descriptions, make certain they understand the organizational chart for aspirations, whether it be for job shadowing, whether it be through concentration of, of how to navigate this entire district or their job, how to transition from one, from one uh, I would say one vertical to the next vertical, all of that is is continued to be in place. And uh, you know, today I know we had an individual that may that only sp spoke Spanish, and you know, for us in, in being able to work with a board member to connect them with an individual that can be you know, they can be fluent with them and really identify the possibilities in their district. This happens continuously with our staff. It's important for us, and we are working every single day with all of our schools, especially those that have a great. Um, ELL population to make certain that there's always someone in that front office, bless you, that is is present for them so that we don't turn them off when they come in and say, you know what, wait a minute, let me go find someone. But someone's there every single day. If we can create the hire and that candidate's available, so when they walk in, they're bilingual and be able to meet the needs of our community. It's, it's so important, especially in major pockets of this district. Thank you, Member Perez. Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Item 1002, Memorandum of Agreement for Safe School Officers and Charter Schools. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. We are statutorily required to make certain that uh, every one of our schools in our district, whether they're district-managed schools or charter schools who are under our umbrella that have uh, met the satisfactory requirements related to having a security a school safety officer on their campuses. This evening we're bringing of the 56 charter schools that will, uh, will be operational in the 22-23 school year, we're bringing 47 agreements to the board for approval that we've engaged in. We know that there's going to be a few left that we will bring, but we're negotiating and, and proud to say that every one of the charter schools will be leaning on and using our school safety officer programs and leveraging the uh, uh, individuals that have been trained not only by us, but by uh, you know Chad Cronister's office to make certain that we are implementing the right strategies for success and have an asset at every one of our facilities. So this is 47 of the 56 coming to the board. This is, you know, we are only, we can only charge $50,000 for, for this as that's what required. Um, and it usually probably cost us $57,000 to start up fee to be able to outfit an employee in transition. So this is bringing that agreement to the board for approval. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-1002. I have a motion by Member Hahn and I have a second by Member Vaughn. Thank you. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, and I'm glad that you brought that, um, that, that fee up because I had a lot of questions about whether this was an unfunded mandate. And here it says proposed cost NA, um, but when you mentioned that it might be an extra $7,000 times 50 schools, it does mean that it is something that the district is paying for to provide security at these charter schools. Um, so, you know, I, that's my first question. I mean, so there is some overlap, and in some ways, even if it's not significantly huge compared to our budget, this is somewhat of an unfunded mandate since we incur some cost for it, correct? Yes, ma'am. This is, I would say to the chair, this is an underfunded mandate. I know we get money for safety and security uh, dollars that we get, but it's definitely underfunded. Uh, you know, $7,000 does add, does add up, but, uh, but with the, so this may be a legislative ask to, for legislators to go back and make certain that we are, um, that we are not uh, pushed financially on this and that the charter assumes all of the costs because the initial startup could be, uh, it is more than $50,000 that we are only, that we are limited to be able to extend. And I was curious, it said as of last year, there was one charter school that decided not to use it and instead use the Guardian program. Which school was that? Sorry, that's, I'll let Mrs. Uh, what? Ms. Oh, they're not in operation. Okay. Go ahead, Chintia. Uh Yes, that was East Tampa, and East Tampa is now closed. Okay. Um, and so as of right now, is there a reason why we don't have the MOUs with the other remaining, what is it, 10 schools, 9 schools? How many are left? 9? 
Yes, uh, they all belong to a management company, and uh, it, it's just a negotiating time uh, getting uh, uh, the board to sign the, all the MOAs. Um, so we wanted to make sure that all uh, 56 uh, MOAs were signed and approved before the start of the school. So the next ones will, will be in, at the next board meeting. And then the one last question I had, since they're kind of under us as far as employment goes, if there was an instance where there was a, a problem or, you know, something happened where there would be liability on the part of our resource officers or whatnot, who assumes responsibility if it's at a, a charter school in that situation? Uh, well, be, uh, probably chief is yeah, better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Yeah. Wheeler and I would be happy to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's our yeah. employee. It is we, us. We accept yeah. responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? So why is it that we have to um, take that cost of seven thousand. I'm just curious. Because we are only statutory required, we can only extend a fifty thousand dollar invoice to charter schools. So, and in, in the reality is, is that everyone has to be in compliance. So, when we talk about, you know, with with equipment, with uh, you know, firearms, with ammunition, with you know, down to patches on our uniforms, to belts, to vest, all that is an, it can is a cost. So um, we, we got to make certain that we are statutorily required to extend the services to them, and then that services are capped out at 50000 The issue becomes is that some school districts were, or, or I would say some entities, I'm going to take school districts out, some entities were overcharging, you know, $75,000, $100,000 for resource officers, knowing that if you hired someone, it, it may be, you know, it'd be out, outfit them for $50,000. So they capped it. No, I'm the first for, for security. I am, I'm the first one. But how much did our charter schools get from us last year, just last year alone? Yeah, through the chair around $250 million. Yeah. So in the $250 million, we still have to, they they still trying to get another? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And d didn't these schools also, along with us, receive Marjorie Stillman, um, uh, funding as well. Yes, ma'am. How much did did the um, schools receive yeah, th th in th funding? I don't, I don't have that. It's all that's all based on FTE, the number of students uh, it's equated to. They get. I can get that for you. But charter schools received. Yes, ma'am. Th that money as well. Yeah, I have. No I I just have a qu couple questions following that up. Are we not able to bill them for that additional funding over the top? No, ma'am. To the chair, $50,000 $50, is the cap that we can bill them. And how are other districts handling it? The same way it's coming out of their, their pocket? Yes, ma'am. They're paying for it. And so what can we do, I mean, as a, as a body to kind of challenge that? Yeah, I, I think this is, through the chair, is a great opportunity to put on a legislative platform to potentially move that number to $60,000. And um, I think that it could be a review for whether it's, uh, you know, SBA or, or, or FADS to look and determine what the overall costs are for school districts around the state. Use that information to leverage it and determine whether or not that number needs to be 55000 60000 65,000 because every uh, school district is unique for those charges. So I think that, that it could be an opportunity for us to have, uh, you know, put this on our legislative platform for next year. That was my next question. Sarasota County, other counties like that, it's it's not flat. It's just based, it's individual district or is that flat rate of 50,000? No, through the chairs, flat rate through the entire state. I'm sure other districts are yes, probably sir. even losing more. Okay, I guess that's my only question and thank you for that information. Uh, Member Perez? I do. I have one more question. So, how, what? How is that going to affect us with our budget? What's the total amount? Through, through the chair, when you look at uh, you know you got fifty six. It's it just all openly. It depends on the you know who they hire. It depends on if they hire someone that is seasoned versus someone that is brand new. So once we get all this in place, we'll have a better understanding as the school you know, right before school starts. Once they get everyone in place, determine the overall additional impact financially that will cost the district, and I'll share that with the board. So we're voting on something now that we don't know how it's going to impact us later? 
through the chair, you you have to vote on this to, to make certain that we're all in compliance. Thank you, Member Perez. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Next is the information item, Westlake Consistency Finding Major Modification Zoning Application and Lennar Development Agreement. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mayor, to the Chair, as you know, we continue to, there's definitely a need for us to identify parcels to build, uh, you know, new facilities for our students within our school district. Uh, we've been working closely with the Board of County Commissioners and their staff for growth and development with our teams through Mr. Farkas and his team to identify locations. So this coming tonight is the Westlake uh, property that's 100 acres in the South County. This will be where we put the new high school in 2025. It also will be able to hold a middle school in 2026 and an elementary school in 2027. So this is 100 acres that will have, be able to serve around 3,200 student stations for a high school, 1,500 student stations in our middle school, and 1,000 student stations in the elementary school. So, you know, this is something we des desperately needed to get moving. Because, uh, you know, now we see that more than ever that, you know, our building design is taking more time and more money so we can properly be able to bring it to the board for approval and put it in motion. Mr. Farkas? Just wanted to point out this is a unique circumstance. This is, hasn't really happened before in Hillsborough County. It's a partnership with Lennar Homes, the developer, and with the county and the school district. That tri-party agreement, it took a lot of work uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of lawyers to make that happen. But we just want to say that we're very proud that we were able to, to come to that agreement. Uh, without Lennar being a third party partner, it would not have happened. Uh, it's agreements and offsite improvements that we had to, that were had to be made along Westlake Drive in Waimama. Um, but we're excited with the opportunity that in 2025, now we have approval for this. This is an information item just to say, hey, the county board actually approved this on, on May 10th and make sure you all were aware that that, that big step. So to the growth management staff and, and that, that crew and also the county commission, we want to say thank you so much for all your work because I can't, can't count the hours that were spent on trying to find this uh, resolution. But luckily it's come to, uh, come to fruition and now we're ready to, to move forward and build. Okay, great. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Member, Member Hahn? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been in the works since I was first elected to this board, so I know it's been a while <laughs> that we've been waiting for this to, to really happen. So then um, it is a unique circumstance, as Mr. Farkas said, where typically the county commission would provide the money for the infrastructure, but um, I just want to thank Lennar for stepping up and providing that. It was above and beyond, and um, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're, we're going to move forward now, but we certainly couldn't do it without their, their um, resources. So thanks. Ditto. Thank you, Member Hahn. We're going to go ahead and move to employee input if there's no other comments. Employee input. We will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it's sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representative, emails, phone calls, and one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. I will now call the first speaker. I am Carissa Denica from Gaither High School. Um, good afternoon. At the last HCTA bargaining meeting, we were offered non-recurring payments equal to our years of service. We uh, do not move up in years in service, the same as last school year. So based on that, why would we expect more next year? It's a very real possibility that many of us will make less next year. Moreover, for instructional, there are seven years of service right now that make the same amount for years and years. For non-instructional employees starting in October uh, that aren't making $15 an hour are going to be moved up to $15 an hour. That means that people that have been working on the job for one day are going to be making the same amount as people who have worked for you for years. 
Who wants to work here when they make the same as a person with less experience? Who wants to work here when there is no cost of living increase or salary increases as stated? The optics of this board are dreadful from the viewpoint of many of the people who work with students every day. You voted for a 4% increase in pay for the superintendent. It doesn't matter that you have to vote for that to happen. Most teachers don't get a 4% increase in pay and we aren't seeing any increase in pay. You also voted to increase the pay of substitute teachers. It's needed. I'm not saying that it isn't. However, the people that are with those kids every single day are having to fight for their, their raises. We get praised as the district has risen to the top 20 districts in Florida. We get praised that the schools in the transformation network improved their school grades, which they should. My own children's school raised their grade um, and we are ecstatic. We are doing the work and we are seeing nothing in return. A possible solution because I like to do that. And it might not be that everybody likes it. Do the non-recurring payments with the, end of, uh, with the end of the fiscal year. Everyone has moved to their rightful years of experience. This gives you a year to cut out extraneous spending and focus on what is needed. So many people are having to cut out the extras because they must focus on paying what they need, shelter, food, and clothing. So do you. You need to go through your finances and see where you're spending extra because what you need are the people who work with the students every single day. Thank you. Thank you. We have no ad additional employee input, so we will now move on to superintendent comments. Yes, Madam the Chair. This evening, I just want to take a minute to review Hillsborough County's assessments results. As uh, you know, I are thankful for our, our teacher recognized so many great movements that have made place in, in this last calendar year academically. Um, a year that has been so trying for all of our school-based leaders, all of our teacher support staff, district leaders, but we want to be able to go through and recognize uh, some of the greatest accomplishments we've had. One of the areas of focus that we have to focus on for the 22-23 school year is English language arts. And you will see here, if you do a comparative analysis to 21, 2021 to 2022, we stayed the same. So did the state of Florida. And as you see through 2018, 2019, the last time we gave uh, grade, the state gave grades, is that there's a major gap that the pandemic has truly hit in the, in the area of English language arts. However, when you look at the state ranking, even though that we did maintain 50% of, uh, of our third through 10th graders hitting proficiency, we did move up from 37th to 31st in the district, meaning a number of school districts uh, you know, declined, meaning that we, may, we continue to, to maintain within our work. If we look at uh, ELA in FSA and EOC results by grade level from ele by grade band from elementary school, middle school, and high school, we see that in elementary school from third through fifth, we did make uh, movement from from 2021 to 2022, and we had we increased the state rankings uh, by 10 uh, related to elementary. We also, when you look at middle school and high school, there was a one percentage decline. Uh, that is on pace with what the state endured overall in middle school. But when you look at the state rankings, we, we made tremendous gains in the state rankings from 2019 to 22 in middle school and did the same thing in high school with high school slipping one percentage points. This is us going back to make certain that we have uh, sufficient resources, solid professional development within the area of literacy. Literacy is so difficult as we get to the secondary level to make certain we get children actively engaged in that process and really making certain that we focus on the foundational skills in, in elementary school and by, you know, by this board accepting and improving decodables, also expanding uh, you know, classroom libraries for, for, from K through 12, we hope to see greater and stronger work as we move forward. And we have a new curriculum and new standards for, for next year that should help us. So that is a major area of, of, of focus in the area of literacy. In the area of mathematics, we made significant gains in the area of mathematics in, in our school district, moving up state rankings in every one of the third through eighth grade algebra one geometry. We see significant movement in in uh, third grade the eighth grade math with four percentage points six points in algebra one we also have four points uh, percentage point proficiency in the area of geometry this is a hats off to our teachers to our students to our parents making this a concentrated effort and also in our school leaders 
being able to make certain that we provide ongoing professional learning communities that have moved the needle. Um, openly, the areas that, uh, that we are a, a little bit concerned at, even though we saw positive movement in fifth and eighth grade science and also great movement in biology, you see that we had significant movement related to state rankings in biology, moving from 38th through uh, 21st and trying to get in the top 20 next year. We see in the state rankings in fifth and eighth grade that we've got to really figure out what that causation is. Is it because of the lack of hands-on uh, activities for our students? Is it uh, making certain we're leveraging resources? So these are areas that we will focus on moving into the 22-23 school year. But we, we see the, prog the, the, you know, the academic progress in every one of these elements. And then looking at civics and also looking at U.S. history, you know, civics going from 51st in the, in the state to 21st, and then also in U.S. history making make great strides as well. Uh, these two areas has is, is really helped us in overall in our school grade and our teachers have done a really good job through master scheduling to make certain we have the students in, in these core contents. Overall, it's about the achievement gap. Um, we see that in, in literacy, we've made some marginal progression with black and Hispanic subgroups. But when we look at ELA, uh, you know, from a learning gain perspective, we made some tremendous work with you know, four to five percent of uh, you know of our students moving the needle through academic gains, and then social studies, math, and 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 learning gains also moving the needle overall. And this is really focusing on our instructional frameworks with small group instruction, leveraging our tier two and tier three resources, and really paying attention to our students overall at scale and uh, making certain that they have all the wraparound services they need through interventions to become proficient within, within our school district. And this, and this is a district comparison from 2019 to 2022 and all the accountability measures and openly moving the needle once again in, in every facet, uh, you know, related to this process. Um, and then, you know, being right on the doorsteps of being that A school district. And, you know, hopefully next year we'll, we'll plan to be able to, to celebrate that A. That'll be our focus. And then when you look at the overall of our state rankings, we made tremendous gains. And, and I'm just so proud of our principals. I'm so proud of our teachers, our support staff, our regional superintendents, our chiefs that have all worked in a collaborative effort and also academic services and professional development to really make this a reality. And for the, you know, when you look at the grade distribution uh, overall, we have more A, Bs, and Cs than we've, we've ever had before. And uh, moving the needle for the transformation 28 you know dnf schools when i came in that was a historical dnf schools we they made it our priority and under the leadership of shay mccray and her team just eliminating that process and so thankful for super Ken kenhart and all those regionals as well being able to create gr uh, greater change systemic change within our school district and this is major game changing elements and now it's about sustainability as we move forward and possibility of next year eliminating Every D, you know the transformation of historical DNF schools and moving the moving the needle for for next year and the top performers you know so proud of these schools that uh, your systemic top performer performers in elementary middle and high school who continued their efforts and uh, dedicated their time and then look at the you know the the significant growth that we see within our school district 247 points to, for to 104 points those are magnificent points. Uh, to be able to move. Those are hard enough to move in a regular year, but most likely moving it in a pandemic year. So hats off to these leaders and their staffs for their concentrated effort. And then also coming in, we knew there were 39 persistently low performing schools and we were able to move 17 off that list. And, um, you know, that's through concentrated effort, being very strategic in, in, in leadership, being very strategic about instructional resources and supports and really uh, grow on systemic systems to be able to focus on analytical moves. You know, moving forward, we continue to focus on eliminating the historical DNF schools. We have five remaining, we continue to move, remove student schools from underperforming, persistently performing as identified by the state. But we this year is focused on the new assessment, new standards for mathematics and, and, and also for literacy and really supporting our teachers and also focus on the well-being as we, as we do this. And for the first time you know, ever, we're in the top 20 school districts in the state of Florida, going back to uh, you know, our number 19, starting up with 2015 or 20, but we're in the highest ever ranked academically, which is hats off to this board, hats off for the accountability, hats off to, the, to every team member 
within this school district, and we're so thankful for this process. Now our goal is to be in the top 10. We'll have a relentless aspect and an approach to do that, and we'll need everyone's help to be successful. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent J Davis. Thank you so much. Member Washington, we'll move on to board comments. Yeah, board comments. Yes. Okay, we'll go ahead and start with you, with okay. Member Washington. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be brief tonight. I am truly elated uh, for the district, <clears throat> for this great improvement, and it's everybody. Not only is the custodians, all the employees had to have input uh, to make these schools successful. Uh, Shay, I really appreciate y'all. Y'all done a great job, um, and and really about a year and a half because you know really about a year if you tell the truth because you know we had COVID so one of those times I mean we we really couldn't do what we need needed to be done during that period of time, but I I am truly elated especially in District Five you know, hey look it's hard, it's hard, and you know I, I guess. Sometimes you, you get beat up so bad, you know, we want to praise what people do. You know, we are so negative, you know, we got to be positive. You know, we got to look at the bright points in life and spots because that's what matter. Anybody could be negative and it, it, it's always constantly uh, negativity going on. And we got to work as a team. You can see what we can do when we work as a team. We make it work. Hey, we're a fine tuned machine. We're making it work because, you know, you look at, what, a year and a half, two years ago, in, in, in District 5, we had 22 schools in transformation. We don't have any other schools in the transformation in District 5 now. They came, they came up. Uh, look at, we got renovations going on now that we never had before. You know, we're working hard, but I want people to realize just because we don't run our mouth in a negative way, that doesn't mean we're not doing a good job. Because we are doing a hell of a job. At the board, the board, we all work together. You know, every board member has helped me in District 5. And I appreciate that. Because we are a team. And we've been working as a team. And we got to continue working as a team. Are we at the top? No. We have a long ways to go, people. I mean, really, a long ways to go. But you know what? At the end of the day, we'll get there. We just keep working like we're doing. We'll get there. Yeah, we, we got to look at pipeline. You got to look at all of this. But those are things that the community, the parents, everybody has to get involved. That's not a one-man show. This is not the shaky show. This show is for everybody. This is a show that we all work together. Dr. Hahn, I appreciate you coming to District 5 with the books. I mean, really, you know? I mean, I, I, mean, I appreciate it, Ms. Vaughn, how you, how you bear it out, and, and, and Ms. Combs, all of you, and, and Ms. Perez, because we know what we need to do. And when we know what we need to do, we are successful. So, hey, that's it. I am through preaching for the day. But I truly thank you all for all what we have done as a team. The employees in Hillsborough County, I, tru I truly appreciate that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? I know, I always sign up to go after Member Washington. It's like I have to come in after the coach. Um, but no, I, I anticipate every board member and their comments sometime tonight are, are really going to say thank you to everyone in our district for the amazing success we've had. Um, as Member Washington said, this is you know, is a team effort all the way from, you know, the people who work in the lunchrooms to make sure that our students are safe, the crossing guards, um, all of our teachers and staff, all of our reading uh, resource teachers, everyone at the district. Um, it's just, it's, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate stuff like that. So thank you for highlighting that. And thank you to everybody um, who's worked so hard. Um, I'm going to pivot just a little bit. Um, on Thursday, last Thursday, I was able to do a town hall meeting with some of our legislators in North Tampa. Pablo, do you have those photos that I sent to you last minute that you were very kind and accommodating with? Um, so we had a, a forum in New Tampa. That's not the best picture, but you can see I was with Representative Ventress. Driscoll, um, Senator Janet Cruz, Councilman Luis Vieira, and myself. You can show the next picture. Um, is that the only one? So we had a little forum. There's probably one other picture. I didn't take these pictures. Or a, 
They might be better quality. But um, as you can see, um, we had probably about 75, 80 people in attendance. And it was really great to be able to talk to people about their concerns. And while people were very excited about the progress we're making, um, I had some people stay and talk to me afterwards who are very concerned about what our teacher had spoken about. And that's about, um, you know, the salaries of the people in our schools. They, you know, people in my neighborhood have heard that some teachers are homeless, that there are concerns with them not being able to, to stay at our school because they have to move so far away. So surprisingly enough, what people were speaking to me the most about were what we're doing to make sure that we're recru rec not just recruiting, but retaining our teachers and our staff and, you know, how we're supporting them, how we're making sure that they have livable wages in an economy that's so hard that they can work by their schools. That's what people really wanted to talk to me about. So um, I was surprised that, you know, so many of my constituents were really engaged in this issue and wanted to speak to me about that. So it was really nice to be able to talk to them. It was a great forum. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get out now that COVID's a little bit done and do some more town halls and get to talk to people. Um, the next thing I wanted to kind of talk about was it is, um, July is National Disability Pride Month. And so I'll read you a little bit about that because I don't think we had a proclamation about that. July is a Disability Pride Month, which is celebrating its 32nd year after the Americans with Disabilities Act ADA was passed on July 26, 1990 to prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. So I want to say happy uh, Disability Pride Month. Um, uh, and I think that is it. Yep, talked about the town hall, said congratulations to everybody, and talked about Pride Month. So that's all I have. Oh, and you're going to talk about the Gentleman's Quest, right, Member Combs? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I want to first thank our, our teachers, our staff, everyone, because without you, we would not be where we are, um, you know, and, and ranking where we are today. Um, and I want to impose in there the fact that throughout all this, we had a national mental health crisis, not just here in Hillsborough County, but nationally. And that the teachers took on learning about trauma, how to address this trauma with our, with our students. And, you know, they, they shored up their classrooms, they shored up our, our, our students, and they made this possible. Without, I gotta say the superintendent, without our teachers, you know, in the front lines with our students, I don't think we would be where we are today. Just gonna say that. Um, you know, to, to, to have to uh, go to a parent's home of a student who committed suicide is the worst, is the worst possible thing anyone could experience. And I really hope, board members, that you never have to be that support to those parents who have experienced the loss of a child due to suicide. But I, th I know, I know that because of the support of our teachers that we are to where we are today and that our students were able to make it through to give us our, what we have today and, and, and where we are as a district. Um, but transitioning over to something that I am so excited about. Um, so the National Suicide Crisis Hotline is going to debut on July 16th. I'm really excited about that because, you know, mental health is what I speak about, the mental health of our children our teachers, our staff, all of us here. Um, and I think the last few years has really been taxing on us. So, um, um, Pablo, can you? So, um, the F Florida statute 10.08.36, um, um, beginning 2021-2022 school year, any student identification card by a public school to students six through 12 must include the telephone numbers for national and statewide crisis and suicide hotline. I am so excited about this. 
So any student ID card that we're going to be issuing our, our, our students will have that, um, that number on it. Now, um, according to the 2121 data, more than 37% of high school students reported that they experienced poor mental health during COVID. And more than half, 55% reported that they experienced emotional abuse by a parent or other um, adults in a home. But I want to point out that recently, uh, Sean Mendez, I know that many of us know who he is. Um, the fact that I know who he is, I'm shocked. But, um, and Selena Gomez have, have all come to the forefront to, to talk about them having to step back from the limelight because they're taking care of their mental wellness. So imagine if those, those two amongst others, because I've only, I've only named them two, but there's many others, had to take a step back, imagine where our students are mentally and emotionally. So, you know, I would, I, you know, I'm very excited to bring this to the forefront for our, for our students to support them, you know, with where they are in their mental health. And, you know, like I always say, when I go out, you know, throughout, you know, even as, you know, in Orlando, they always tout the Hillsborough County schools regarding the mental health resources we've provided and the supports we've provided for our students and our staff. So, you know, I'm just really excited about this and looking forward to it, it's in, you know, starting with our students. Thank you. Thank you, Member Prez. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. Um, I was very excited when we received the um, news around the school grades and our ranking. Uh, it's certainly something that we've been talking about um, since I've been on the school board. And one of the biggest reasons that um, uh, we brought Superintendent Davis here to Hillsborough County because when he interviewed, um, you know, his his strategies and his ideology around how to turn schools around um, was very impressive. And um, you know, we we definitely had high hopes, and you delivered. So thank you, Superintendent Davis. I appreciate that. I know your staff has worked very hard alongside of you. Um, and uh, our teachers and our principals and our staff have worked extremely hard and we have moved the needle even faced with some of the most challenging times through the pandemic. So i um, very proud of the work everyone has done. Um, you know, we also have community partners that have really wrapped their arms around our children and families in this community and contribute to this good news as well. So thank you to them and our parents, our parents who are our children's and our students' first teacher in life. And they really um, continue to have the biggest impact on their child's lifelong learning. And it's been very tough on them as well this, these last few years. And so um, it certainly is uh, super, um, <laughs> Superintendent, not superintendent. <laughs> um, school board member Washington had said it really has been a big team effort. And, you know, I think as long as I've been in education 30 somewhat years now, you know, I, the, the organizations and the schools that I've worked with that really have the biggest impact and are the most successful are the ones that are very focused on shared decision making and consensus building and collaboration and um, those are things that are part, are, are part of our climate and culture, and I hope we continue down this path. And um, congratulations to everyone again, and I'm glad we're taking this time at the end of this meeting to have a nice celebration around this, because we know there's lots of challenges that always lie ahead in, a, in any school district, but our district is, is a large district and diverse. And we know we have lots more work to do, but I think stopping and really celebrating these moments is what can help buoy us all through the challenging times. So it's important to, to stop and pause and recognize it and celebrate it without a but at the end of the sentence and just put a period or an exclamation mark at the end. So um, thank you for the time. Remember,
Thank you, Member Hahn. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and Pablo, if you want to queue up a short video, uh, Member Vaughn, Member Washington and I, we were with, uh, with the Gentleman's Quest last Saturday, which is a, a large group of young men who come together, and really it's about um, just setting the, there's no, there's no top to the ceiling, to doing whatever they can in STEM, and, and they go to different trips. A lot of these students are first-generation college students, and so what was amazing is there was a showcase, a STEM showcase, and these are the, the first place winners, and you can see Member Washington each gave them a bag of money, okay, no joke, for the first place win, um, and this young man also received a scholarship of $25,000 as well uh, that day from Kaiser. What's amazing is all these young men, it was all eight different groups of, of young men, and they had a STEM, they had to come up with a concept. It was all challenges, either it was challenges the city had, the district had, the county had, and the first place winners, they came up with a solution, and they created a robot to be able, for a teacher, to be able to recognize a face in order to take attendance. So they actually had a robot where they would actually uh, recognize. So this is all these young men, and I want to thank Tyrus Maverick who started this um, organization and all the individuals who support that. Um, it's so important because it really is about setting that stone and getting that first child and getting involved because over and over what we see is what makes a big move for students is having those mentors and people around them who believe in them, who support them, and I think that's extremely important. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, about a week ago, I was in Rosac and I heard so much yelling and screaming, and that was the Transformation Network um, celebrating, you know, when they saw their scores. And I've known Ms. McRae for, gosh, almost 30 years now, and she's just an unbelievable leader, and I want to thank you and your entire team for transforming and continuing to move the students who are the, the most in need, moving them up, and Superintendent Davis, and your cabinet, and really it takes so much more than just just you know the board or the superintendent it's that bus driver who sees that child in the beginning of the day and says good luck on your test it's the custodian it's the nutrition it's the teachers it's everyone so it takes the entire team and I talked to I called uh, Miss McCoy from Leto High School when she moved to a B and I did tell her I said it's amazing that Leto moved to B but what's more amazing was was I was at graduation and when I saw those kids walking across the stage and walking and hugging her and you know and she knew knew all of them and that's what it takes those schools move because people care about those children and that's what moves children is people care about them so it's not always an online program or curriculum it really is about kids being cared about people knowing that if you see the schools that had the biggest movement because I know one of the principals I saw she said well I just change my hair colors and and the students would change their hair that color as well because guess what it's a community and that's what it takes and that's why it's really important that we keep pushing to get this millage we have to do something for our individuals who work for this district we have to do something we cannot go into the district 700 teachers short students need people in front of them so we have to do everything we can do to make sure that we can support those teachers and support the faculty and staff because I don't know of a single job that you don't get a raise for six years and year seven you get a hundred dollars I said this the other day I had a teacher email me the other day and she said at 42 years old she had to move in with her mom because she can't afford to live in Tampa and she's a teacher at an elementary school so we have to really push to whatever we need to do we have to push for that millage we do the increase of millage we have to do that I mean no matter if you're Republican Democrat independent it doesn't matter if you want to change our city and you want our city to be safe and kids to have a opportunity for life and growth it has to come through education so I want to congratulate everyone we have to continue to do well we can have to continue to support everyone and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and this meeting is Madam adjourned. Chair, oh. we have one speak uh, employee that showed up to speak oh today, yes please oh yes Sorry. this and this is why we're here for our employees so thank you so much I didn't see that 
Hi, um, I'm Missy Carl. Um, I'm a teacher at Grady Elementary School, and I'm excited because uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools ranked now 19th in the state, which is incredible. Also, the school I teach at is ranked number one in the district and number nine in the state. So we're very excited. Thank you. Um, today, I would like to talk about salary negotiations. As you know, last year, in lieu of a step increase, we were given a supplement, which is a bonus. The bonus helped my family offset the inflated costs of food, gas, and medical expenses, but a bonus is not a salary increase. You're also aware that the salary negotiations continued since the last board meeting. I attended knowing that HCTA proposed an MOU asking for our step increase to be given from last year along with this year's step. I thought this was a reasonable ask and anticipated an agreement in this line item. Unfortunately, it was not accepted. The district countered with another supplement, another bonus. Two years of supplements do not equal the financial security of two years of promised step increases. This is a financial security issue. You're my employer, I'm an employee, your employee. I trust you to take care of me and my family by paying fair wages. HCTEA will be uh, meeting for round three of salary negotiations July 20th. Please accept the first line offer that states all bargaining units shall be credited with one year of experience and shall advance on the respective salary schedules accordingly. By agreeing to this line item, you will create financial stability for your employees. Please accept this bargaining proposal on July 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional employee inputs? I don't think so. Any employee comments? Thank you so much, and this meeting is adjourned, and have a nice evening.